Okay. A few other people will come here, but I think we'll get started. And um, we're going live. We're streaming out live to the world, and then this uh, will be up on YouTube within minutes after we finish. So the topic at hand is multi-cloud. If you looked at the conference program, you saw some I'm Roger, by the way, if you haven't seen me for the last two days. Um, I wrote some copy to entice people to come. I'm not going to read through it. The key thing that we want to talk about here with multi-cloud is the real-world challenges in working with these complex environments and how doing so can improve an organization. What we've done is assembled four people, and each of them has a different view of multi-cloud, what it means to them, their companies, and their customers. So we're going to start with that. Now our panelists are from your left to your right, a little trouble with directions, <clears throat> our J.R. Stormit with Cloudability, our Chana Kesevan with Thousand Eyes, Scott Harvey, and that's Atmosera, right? That's, that's you got it. it. Man, I, I, I can't hear and I can't see anymore. It's terrible. And, and Jason Carlin with Flexential. So we're here. Each of you has different viewpoints. I'm just going to start right here, say a little bit about what you do, and what does multi-cloud mean to you, your company, and your customers? So good evening. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around. I know I'm, we're keeping you from <coughs> dinner or beer, so we'll, we'll try and make it interesting. Um, so, yeah, I'm J.R. Stormont. I am one of the co-founders of Cloudability. Uh, Cloudability uh, is a platform that was just acquired by uh, Aptio, and Cloudability is focused all about how do we improve the economics of cloud, specifically making sure that we can pull together all these business teams, finance teams, and tech teams who normally don't really work together very well to make sure that they can understand the cost impacts and make sure they're getting the most value out of it. So in my role the last, you know, nine years of doing this, um, I've had kind of an interesting perspective because I've, I've got to sit there and watch essentially the, the 10 billion of cloud spend that we manage in the public cloud across all these three providers. Um, and for a long time, multi-cloud was a really great talking point. It was, we're going to get there. It's going to be happening. And you know, it wasn't until it feel like just a couple years ago uh, that we really started to see you know, this sort of true multi-cloud start to come out where some of our large customers, the, you know, the Fortune 100s of the world, would you know, suddenly then have two. It wasn't just AWS or it wasn't just Azure. It was both together. Um, Whenever multi-cloud comes up for us, though, and I'm talking to customers about it, I feel like there's a real misconception about why to do it. So there's a lot of talk about vendor lock-in. You've got to go multi-cloud so you can have more flexibility around your rate negotiations and this and that. But I think the companies I've seen be really successful at it are not doing it for that reason, because they're not looking to cloud as a driver of cost savings. They're looking to cloud as a driver of innovation. And specifically, what they're going, they're going and choosing a technology provider AWS or Azure or GCP, based specifically not on the price, but on that one has the right fit of technology for what we're trying to accomplish. So typically what we've seen with the multi-cloud world, and I think where the, the challenge and the opportunity is, in order to truly make it work, you've got to have a diverse set of skills in the teams. And for the most part, most of the companies worked with over the years, they either know AWS or they know Azure or they're scaling up on GCP. Um, so often multi-cloud, I think the opportunity comes in to say, all right, you know, it's often they've acquired another company that has a different you know, provider in there, or they've had a new team that's come in and said, you know, we need to basically uh, look to find a new technology. And so a good example of this uh, is uh, Google. They've been doing really well with, say, BigQuery. A lot of companies are going over to use the analytics service. But we're finding typically that's really the starting point, is people just starting to get their foot wet with that one technology. Okay. Tom? Hey, my name's Archana. I'm director of product marketing at Thousand Eyes. Um, and and to your point earlier, like, you know, marketing, um, multi-cloud was uh, a marketing buzzword a few years ago. Um, right now, if you are denying multi-cloud, you just don't know your multi-cloud as yet, I feel. So either you're multi-cloud by intention, which is best of breed of, you know, um, solutions, avoid vendor lockdown, whatever the reason would be, or you're inherently multi-cloud in terms of back-end API calls that are made, and you are relying on these other cloud providers, right? Um, the way I see multi-cloud as and what our customers are seeing is um, really from the perspective of um, as you're moving to the cloud, as you're now starting to rely on more than one cloud, these are environments that you don't own or you don't really control, 
but how do you get visibility and operationally benefit by running on these crowds, right? Um, and that's really what Thousand Eyes does as well as a company. We provide network intelligence to understanding um, environments that you don't own or control. Um, one of the things about um, multi-cloud that stands out for me is um, it's just not infrastructure as a service providers that form into the bucket of multi-cloud, but also looking at SaaS app providers too, because they are in their own cloud as well. Right, so, and, and any simple application that, that you build today has backend, you know, um, hooks, API hooks into another service or application, for instance. Like, let's take Uber for, as just an, as an example here is, um, you can call the, call your cab, you can text the driver, which is a Twilio probably uh, hook into Twilio's environment. You know, you can see what the weather is, which is probably another API call into uh, wherever weather.com might be located. And all of that results in, you know, multiple channels of communication across multi-cloud, different cloud vendors, right? So if one part of that, you know, service doesn't work, then that ends up affecting how your users are really consuming it. So understanding multi-cloud, not just from the prov prov provisioning of, you know, um, which is the best cloud for me and should I look at multiple solutions, best of breeds, either in terms of services, either in terms of performance, but also inherently knowing that you are in a multi-cloud environment in default and you need to have the right, you know, um, tools in place to, you know, actually know those dependencies and understand those dependencies when something goes wrong operationally. Okay, Scott. Thanks. Uh, my name is Scott Harvey. I run engineering and operations for Atmosera. And at Atmosera, we have a slightly different perspective on multi-cloud. And it, it comes really more from the operational base. You know, it, it, the, the two to my right have talked a lot about the hyperscaler clouds and the SaaS-based clouds. And the problems we try and solve for our clients, they're really more the practical, how do I get out of the cloud that I'm in on-prem and into something that's more data center centric or even into a hyperscaler cloud. So it's that migration of their, their workloads from the, where they currently exist to the next place that they're going to be. And really looking at the assessment and then the migration and deployment of that through the entire process and then obviously the operationalization of that as it goes forward. But it's really interesting because when we work with our clients, uh, oftentimes they'll come to us and say, we need to be in all three clouds all three hyperscaler clouds. Well, do we really? Um, what is the need to do that? And then we start dissecting the actual workloads and applications that they're, they're hosting in their on-prem or their data center environment and find out it really isn't a need, right? It's a good goal. We should be looking at how we re-architect those things, how we make those migration uh, steps better and easier in a later time. But right now, what is the physical need to move from here to there? So multi-cloud to us really is about the customer's journey and making a multi-cloud available to the most people in the mo that makes the most sense today. And I think it's just different scales of where people are operating, certainly. Okay, Jason? Thanks, um, Jason Carlin with Flexential. Uh, we are a top five network connected data center provider, technology services provider. Um, here in, here in the U.S. primarily. Uh, multi-cloud, I think, um, you know, multi-cloud for me is, is sort of like uh, air, water, beer. It's just sort of almost something that you assume is the, is the way it happens today. I think ideally it's, it's trying to move towards, you know, really what I think is the hybrid opportunity about being able to take the best attributes of, of different platforms and really make it work together. And um, it, it takes, you know, a skill set to do that. Otherwise, I think you end up overbuying, you end up overpurchasing, you end up trying to deploy a lot of the same you know, data or tools in mul multiple cloud platforms like the other panelists mentioned. Um, and it's very duplicative spend. You start to lose control or even worse, you start to open up various security vectors into your old school enterprise and, and now have you know, created even more security concerns. So I think our approach really is taking the sort of best of breed of, of being able to look at the application set not all applications are created equal, not all customers are in the same part of the journey, and really trying to figure out how co-location, private cloud, and the hyperscaler technologies can work together to really provide the best outcome for the customer. I have this, uh, this idea that the word buzzword is a buzzword in itself, that actually these terms do mean something. But with multi-cloud, I, I have this impression that people that produce conferences like this term because it, it seems to simplify things, so there's that. The other thing is that on the rare occasion I go shopping, I like that I have a lot of choice. So I needed to have some shoes to do my, I, I believe it or not, I work out. And I needed shoes. And I liked that there were like 20 different brands and cars, et cetera. 
say consumer stuff. When we get to enterprise IT, sometimes it seems to be there's a, this anxiety, and maybe it's just among analysts, that there's too many brands, there's too much choice, it's chaotic. I think chaos is good, and in fact, multi-cloud may just be a term that is not important. So my question, I guess, is when you engage with customers, after you get engaged, how many times do you actually say multi-cloud compared to the conversations you're having about just solving their problem with enterprise IT? Yeah, I mean, so from our world, which is the, the billing and cost world, yeah. you look at Amazon, for example, they've got 200,000 product SKUs. Okay. That's just one provider, and they're billing at second level revolu resolution. So you're talking about like millions of data points yeah. per month per all these SKUs. Uh, and you start to spread that out across Azure, who's not quite as many, but has a lot of complexity, and Google starts to add up. Uh, and this, this world of complexity emerges where this is why you know, I think the companies we've seen do the best and fastest at this. So uh, I was working with a, a tech unicorn in, in Europe. Um, and they're one of the largest cloud spenders uh, they've ever come across, you know, well up into to nine figures a year. And we found that you know, they had put their foot down in multi-cloud and said, no, like, mm -hmm. we have picked our provider, and anybody who tries to bring it in, we're going to stop. Mm -hmm. Not because we don't think there's good technologies there, not because you know, we can't get better pricing, because like, we need to basically be the best at what we do. We need to move fast. And the more we have to learn these different places, the harder it is. So we found between them, and I think where the enterprises who do it have to get really good at is getting down to the core concepts of, OK, how do we start to take you know, the value we're getting out of the cloud and tie that to the cost? How do we get down to optimization of your rates and your usage and all these areas? So that as you're going into it, whether you decide to go full horse or not, you're starting to build up this base of knowledge in the organization about how to manage cloud. Because managing cloud is, from a financial perspective, mostly the same between the providers. But getting the skill to actually be able to do that at scale is really the first challenge. Yeah, and, and Artana, in your world, again, that once you get past that initial conversation, what's the reality, real-world reality, of you working with your customers? Well, the first time they come to us, it's really about, hey, we're moving to the cloud, or we've already moved to the cloud, or mm -hmm. we've migrated, and you know things are not working as we expected it to work, right? Mm -hmm. um, Surprise. Well, yeah. Um, we see that in the case of SD-WAN. We see that in the case of Office 365 or, you know, um, yeah. any, any cloud app you, that you take or they've just moved their own services um, into um, AWS or Google Cloud, for instance, right? And then they come to us and say something's broken and we don't know what's broken. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have enough uh, information out there to convince AWS that it's their fault. There's always lots of finger pointing that goes on. So the conversation starts there. Yeah. And it starts with one cloud or one application. That's a problem. But then it slowly starts uh, moving into these you know, dependencies that they start noticing. So a lot of times we've um, run across enterprises that don't know that they have certain dependencies, right? Um, and we help them identify those dependencies. Only when it breaks, they know there is a dependency. For instance, um, when, um, I think this was a couple of years ago, um, AWS S3 had an outage. It was a fat fingering configuration. It took down S3 in US East, right? And um, it took down their uh, monitoring page as well. So you really couldn't see their status page because that was hosted on S3. And you didn't know those dependencies. And there were customers who were running into, we didn't know we had a dependency on S3. We didn't know we were making this call to, we thought we were in Office 365. But then you look at their transactions and there's a call going on to Akamai, for instance. So they don't know those dependencies as exist. So once they start identifying those dependencies, this picture of multi-cloud expands. Um, but also the other um, in, you know, factor that changes this is uh, who you are speaking to and which part of the organization you're speaking to, right? If you're speaking to the network or the operations team, they might go with one cloud, but an app team might go with another cloud. They all start with going with what cloud works for them at best, and then as they keep scaling, at some point there is an intersection that comes in and then it becomes multi-cloud there, right? So um, a lot of different ways the conversation flows, uh, but you know, it comes back to multi-cloud very quickly. Right, and Scott, in your world, I mean, how quickly do you get from that multi-cloud thing into, like, the real world? <laughs> Honestly, Roger, I'm not even sure we ever say multi-cloud even in the sales cycle. I mean, yeah. it, it, that's what I'm... It, it certainly is something that's out there in the marketing yeah. jargon and a buzzword to be talked about, no question. But, okay. And, and it certainly means something in terms of what everybody perceives it to mean. But, you know, we got to get on the same page of what it does mean when we start talking to our clients and get in the room and start hashing through there what does a proposal look like and what does your existing environment look like and what does it mean to move to these other places. And 
And we say hybrid more than we say multi-cloud. Yes. Uh, hybrid is, is really the, the direction that's kind of coming back. I mean, it was a big buzzword a few years back, and now it's actually a reality. So we see this as more of the, the path for most of our clients because ultimately what they have is they've got legacy applications that don't make any sense to move. Right? You wouldn't want to invest the, the time to transform those applications. They're going to be at the end of their life cycle anyway, so you're going to want to leave them right where they are at because you've got a capital investment in an on-prem data center that you already made, and it doesn't cost a lot to leave it where it is, at least for the time to develop the next generation of that particular application. So nine times out of ten, that's what we find, is, is folks will leave their application, their legacy application, right where it is, and then they'll embark on a new cloud journey in a different cloud, whatever cloud is making sense for them in terms right. of whether it be private, multi-tenanted private, or hyperscaler cloud. So they're not buying shoes or cars, but, but this idea of choice sounds like that's the, that's the critical thing. Right, yes. And that gives you a lot of tools and solutions that you can provide. Yes. Is that sort of your reality as well, Jason? Or? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we generally try to, to talk about three things and, and cost being, uh, the, I call it the three C's, so cost, control, and compliance, and security is kind of wrapped into, into compliance, but um, you know, I think control also is, uh, the element of choice is there as well. And I think as customers you know, scale, they, they, they have decisions to make, and I think there's some articles out there about Pinterest as an example. Their Amazon bill is somewhere in the $200 million a year mark. Um, you know, once you pay $200 million a year for all those resources, you don't really have, you know, you pay another $200 million the next year, right? So it's not, you could take some of those dollars and buy, you know, equipment that you could depreciate and still run those services on. Um, or you could look at, you know, paying more OPEX as part of the situation. So being able to have a conversation with a customer of scale, um, you know, about the cost model that they're in. And then having them also understand, you know, how they want to control the architecture and control the infrastructure. Um, you know, whether that's the dependency knowledge of, of when the internet's broken, but it's really S3, or great use case just a few weeks ago is Google, you know, had a, an instance go down that also had packet loss really across the entire world. And, and customers that are, are paying their bills and want really happy customers um, themselves are, are very focused on dependency management and, and understanding the architecture, which is somewhat hard to, to sort of see or understand in the public cloud world. And then finally, Compliance, which is still a big driver, you know, in terms of understanding where workload placement is, understanding audit procedure and, and what makes sense, you know, based on where um, the customer is in that journey and what kind of data they're putting on the platform. You know, in the, uh, at least two of the descriptions and maybe more than that, I see the word innovation. So here's another word we like to use. And I like to know if um, what it means to, you know, your four perspectives, uh, does it really exist, how do you measure it, uh, and by what it means, does it mean you're improving something, uh, you're creating something completely new, you're getting into new markets, uh, in Scott's case, you're letting some stuff is just going away, but you're going to have to build a new system, is that considered innovation? So that word innovation, how important it is, is it to you, it, it might be of zero importance, but how important is it to you and how do you, how does it manifest itself, how do you actually create something instead of just saying we're innovative. Well, I'd, I'd maybe take that to do, he said we could argue earlier. Yes, so please. I'm going I'm to argue. I, 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 I want. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about Pinterest. It's a real world here. Uh, right? I want the real So, no. I mean, you, you mentioned this aspect of, you know, they spend all this money on it and hundreds of millions a year, and then the next year they have to spend it again. And I would argue that if they didn't do that, they wouldn't even be in business. It wouldn't be a business because what they were able to do was to innovate really quickly and mm -hmm. fast and scale in a way that you can't do in a data center world when you're a small enterprise like that. And so what we're seeing companies do is, you know, the move that's coming out of data centers tends to be, pardon my French, a lift and shit, instead of a lift and shift, where you're taking the, improperly sized. There's another word with sized, F in it too. That, yeah. But go on, yeah. You're, you're taking improperly sized data center resources and putting yes. them improperly sized cloud resources, and of course it, it looks more expensive. So we'll work with them to, you know, right size and optimize that so they get down to the right size and they start saving money. But the ones who are really winning aren't pocketing the money or putting it into hardware. They're reinvesting that money into engineers and better data products and more innovation in that. Because in this world that we live in, the software economy, you know, it's not who can rack the most servers anymore. It's about who can deliver the best experience, the best software, the best features. And that's where the innovation is coming, is taking that money out of investment into hardware, in my very public cloud experience, and putting it into uh, you know, that type of process. Okay. Archana, what's it mean to you and your customers? Innov innovation. Give me a lot of things, <laughs> but um, 
what we see is, you know, in, in my view and, and my yeah. world, which is, which is a little different than um, yes. everybody, or all of the panelists here, is uh, their innovation is really about building um, a stack that allows them to scale well, not just from a technology perspective, but also in a process and operation perspective to actually like thrive in um, a multi-cloud or a cloud world, right? Now that stack could be, uh, am I getting the right public cloud providers? Am I investing in them right? Am I looking at uh, monitoring the right way? Am I changing processes enough? Am I having the right skill sets, for instance, for people? to be able for them to provide the services that they need. So, you know, they look at it um, multiple different ways, but, you know, really from an operational perspective is um, having them evolve or them thinking of evolving their monitoring stack to better fit the cloud uh, world is, is what we're, we're seeing. I think there's, in this case, two kinds of innovation, the evolutionary innovation and the revolutionary innovation. I think you've, you, both of you have nailed it, right? You've got evolutionary innovation, you've got revolutionary innovation. And I think both are perfectly valid. And it just depends where the client is with their particular journey into the cloud. You know, some are ready for that revolutionary innovation, some are not. So I, I think it really just does depend on, uh, on where, they're, where they're at. But is it important? It absolutely is important. Innovation is how you, how you move forward. Without innovation, you're going to die. So you really have to pick one path or the other, and some people are more ready for one than the other. And certainly in the conversations, if you can convince somebody to have a revolutionary innovation period and you know, jettison the entire stack of what they're currently running on and redeploy into, into hyperscaler and have a whole bunch of DevOps engineers that are out there supporting that, that's absolutely fantastic and certainly would be great. Uh, but the reality of it sometimes sets in, and some of our clients can't, can't bite that off. So I really think there are two types of innovation. Yeah, I'd agree with what, uh, what Scott said. I think just to pick up on, on JR's comments on, on sort of the investment side, I think, and maybe speaking about innovation as well, there are, there are companies out there, Dropbox being a, a great you know, sort of public example that has been able to refactor their world to make it have make sense in, in a large scale deployment inside of a, a data center. In terms of innovation, I think you've, I mean, we've got customers that spend a lot of time with the ODMs in, in Taiwan and the Quantas and the Supermicros, you know, customizing their deployment platform to strip out unnecessary components like USBs and fans and things like that to be able to bring a platform cost down to something that is really much cheaper than the hyperscalers. You know, at the end of the day, you're paying extra for the dynamics in the hyperscale environment that some companies you know, large-scale SaaS platforms just don't need. Um, and that's, you know, certainly a way for them to continue sort of innovating, but yet keeping their cost, you know, control, you know, under, under their, uh, their needs as well. So I think, I think you look at it all ways. Um, I think uh, certainly customers have uh, a desire to have a lot of choice in the market, and I think being able to provide that and, and making sure that companies like us, you know, continue to evolve to give them the right, you know, set of tools to be successful. Without giving away your intellectual property or or any uh, true company secrets you might have. So you mentioned 200,000 different, basically 200,000 different ways to, you know, to make a hamburger or something. So there's a lot of choice. I think we all agree that's great. <clears throat> a lot of choice. It may seem like chaos. Maybe we can talk about culture, but we all know that you do, you do it to some degree have to change organizations too. But what I'm really curious about is all of this choice. How do you help your customers? get a grip on it and, and make sure that there's enough confidence that they're making the right choices among what appears to just to be this vast um, array of, of, it can be very confusing and much more confusing yeah. than me looking at 15 pairs of shoes. <laughs> how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, you, I, I mean, there, there's what process and, you know, discipline do you, can you bring in to it for your customers? There's two things that have shown up in the last 10 years, I think, that have created that complexity, but also the choice, which is yeah. you have cloud, which removed uh, constraints, right? You can get anything you need whenever you need it. And the other side, uh, the proliferation of Agile and DevOps meant faster deployment cycles, which meant that you're shipping more things more quickly. And these two things came together to basically take procurement of resources out of the hands of procurement. Now engineers are the ones who make decisions about what to spend and what to spin up in the public cloud. And so this has created this, you know, what, what was the source of multi-cloud originally, which was uh, shadow IT, rogue IT. Yes. You know, people put it on their credit cards. So from a discipline standpoint, what we've seen emerge is 
because that power has shifted from the spending perspective from procurement to engineering, you now have to have engineers start thinking about cost in a way they never had and their impact on the business. And you have to have finance people who've got to suddenly say, okay, I'm used to paying things quarterly or monthly or thinking in these big chunks, now I've got to think in second level intervals across 200,000 SKUs and I've got to partner with the engineers in a different way and the business has to come together. So the, dis the discipline, and I'll, I'll do the plug for the thing I'm doing tomorrow, I'm doing a talk at 8.30 on the new discipline that's come out, which is FinOps, which is this intersection of DevOps with the finance and business side of the house where they have to come together to actually have these conversations. Um, and that's what we're seeing you know, evolve with them is you know, how do we help them get that new level of uh, distributed decision making baked into the company process. And you have a thousand eyes, so you, you must have a, a very good uh, sensory <laughs> <laughs> sensory infrastructure to help make this choice for your people. Um, so just to add on to what you mentioned, right, um, in terms of bringing the discipline in multiple organizations talking together, that's something that we, um, we've seen um, a lot of our customers get to, right? Like typically um, <clears throat> in their world, um, it's about proving innocence, that it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. And there's a lot of finger pointing that happens. Um, and what happens to the finger pointing in the cloud and in a multi-cloud world even worse is that just that's just, you know, um, it's, it's improportionate, right? Like yeah. everyone's blaming somebody else, no one's solving it, um, and then who's impacted the customer's revenue and so on. So one of the things that, you know, Thousand Eyes um, has helped these organizations do is actually think of, you know, cloud or think of digital transformation or cloud adoption, throw in the buzzwords as more of a company effort, right? Not team effort. And the platform and our solution really brings them together in that perspective to um, avoid any of that finger pointing and then reducing um, that, that innocence, right? So that's something that uh, we've definitely seen uh, organizations and enterprises um, get to. And, and you mentioned evolutionary and revolutionary innovation. And that's also in your world of the context of choice. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you uh, help? Yeah, it, I agree with everything you guys have said in terms of getting people the information so they can make the decisions that make sense, right? And it's about sitting down and understanding where on that journey they're at, you know, what they're ready for, because not everybody is ready for everything at the same time. So you need to understand, you know, where is the finger pointing? Is there finger pointing? Sure. And how is that coming down to the organization? And also that intersection of DevOps and FinTech, totally get with that but some people haven't even adopted DevOps yet. So we have to start there before we can actually get the intersection of the, of the rest, because this is a building block uh, in terms of where we're actually going. So sitting down and having those conversations and training, you know, it's about training, it's about educating um, clients and potential clients about what it is that they're gonna to need to consider as they go through this journey. I think that's critically important. And, and informing them and getting them in the same page, at least opening their eyes to what's going on in these environments and in conferences like this, encourage them to, to make, do some research it is a, a cornerstone of where you have to start with that. Okay. Jason? Yeah, I mean, I think nothing is, is static in this in this world you know, anymore, and I think whether it's the cultural dynamics around DevOps to you know, having the, the sort of thinking that as soon as you deploy something, you're probably gonna have to deploy it again, so you should probably spend the time up front trying to do as much automation as you can rather than leaving it as a, as a side effect. I mean, we're, we're changing our code faster, we're you know, patching systems a lot uh, uh, more often just to try to keep up with security issues. I think uh, there used to be a uh, this was a story from a few years ago, but Facebook, you know, as a Facebook engineer, you could push code into production. Really, anybody had that right and the authority to go do it. They had a great sort of principal engineer, principal architect program that had some level of oversight. But if you ended up pushing a, a feature out and it broke, you, you got to wear a T-shirt for a week that said, you know, I broke Facebook, right? So I think, um, uh, you know, there's, there's ways to go train people with great responsibility comes, you know, great, uh, great... Uh, uh, you know, challenges as well, but being able to sort of say, hey, you know, the change rate here is, is going to continue as we look at more acquisition of data, you know, 5G, edge, et cetera, the change rate just is going to continue and getting the culture set to be able to capture that at that, you know, at that point early in the life cycle is super important. Okay, we have about five minutes left and when we're finished, if you want to speak to any of our panelists, please feel free to approach them here and do it. Okay, three out of four, I heard three out of four mentioned DevOps, so here we go. <clears throat> The last, uh, last five minutes, um, a scale of zero to 10. <laughs> this is an impossible task, but it's okay. Uh, on a scale of zero to 10, how important is the notion of DevOps to what you do? 
and why? Versus, it's not something you buy. It's, yeah, it's, you it's up there. It's, it's in the 8, eight to 10 realm. Um, 8 to 10, the, yeah. Yeah, the, the thing and the one little piece of context I'll add is yeah. for the move from, you know, CapEx to OpEx that we talked yes. about with cloud, the bigger move is the move from fixed investment to variable spend. Yes. And that's, you know, we talked about the financial side. It's that quick moving because it's a whole cultural shift in how you, the whole organization has to think about it. So okay. DevOps has been at the forefront of that, you know. But, Creating that challenge, but also unlocking the innovation. I mean, it's a whole separate panel, but yeah. I, I, three <laughs> of you mentioned it, so there you go. And the one that did not mention it, if it's a zero, it's a zero. But uh, it's, it's not yeah. a zero. It's um, definitely high up there. And to the point um, um, Jason was making yes. is uh, you, if you broke something, you know, the web engineers broke something, you had to wear a T-shirt. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, like, they don't think of breaking something when they're pushing code. Um, and, and what we encourage and what we're seeing is while you're making those changes, constantly know what's, how it's going to impact, because at the end of the day, Facebook, uh, when it started, it wasn't making revenue, now it does, but like, if these are real revenue-making services, a change like that could, could kill it, so be aware. So it's definitely important that DevOps as a community understands why it is important to monitor and baseline performance as well. It's just not the problem of the um, operations or the SRE team to fix what's broken, but for the DevOps team to actually not break anything in the first place. Okay, Scott? Uh, yeah, it's an 11 because uh, certainly, and, and what you said is exactly right. DevOps needs to make sure that they don't break anything with the rest of the company, but DevOps is the entire company. I mean, it's, it needs to be and include everybody. And, and that's why it's so critically important because it is such a base fundamental way of operating that if you do it well and you do it right, you're not going to wear the t-shirt for a week because you will have included all of your design, all of your testing, all your QA, all of your, it'll be in the pipeline, it'll be phased and it'll be caught. Um, you know, but it does take a lot to do it right. And that is the challenge. The speakers go to 11. So there you go. Jason. Gosh, uh, numerically, I, I would say, yeah, it's super important. I think, you know, back in the, in the old days, we used to go try to harden hardware and make, you know, tandems and stratus and things like that, that that didn't go down and didn't fail. The reality is today, you know, applications need to be architected in real time and, and deployed, you know, using the, the technologies that we have to be able to keep them up and keep them monitored and keep them, keep them healthy. And I, I, I just don't know how else you would do it without trying to pull your developers and your operations people closer together and, and really creating the same, you know, same team for it. I think it was it site reliability engineers were super popular like 10 years ago to, to try to improve this, but I think, I think really it is if you're building large scale you know, platforms and you're trying to make money on it and you're trying to um, ensure that your developers actually have a great experience and your operators have a great experience, I'm not sure how else you'd do it. We're actually going to have a DevOps panel tomorrow, one, and I'm not leading it, so it'll probably be a, a really good moderator. We have a DevOps Summit chair named Anand Lakela, and he's going to be here tomorrow to lead, uh, uh, excuse me, to lead that. So I'm going to give a minute and a half back to everybody. So thank you for attending, and, and thank you for watching. And again, please, uh, we just started conversations here. Please feel free to, to approach everybody and start your own conversations with them. Thank you. Thank you.